My name is Keith Moore, I'm the Royal Society's Librarian, and today I'm joined by Dr. Mark Richards, who is uh, an atmospheric physicist from Imperial College. Mark, welcome. And we're here to talk about John Evelyn, one right, of our absolutely. earliest Royal Society fellows, and, and in particular one book that he wrote and published in 1661 called Fumifugium. But, but first of all, Mark, if we had goggles and, and could see the atmosphere, yeah. what, what would it look like? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> it would look like a, some sort of soup <laughs> in some, some respect. I wouldn't say quite say pea soup, uh, but it certainly would look like a soup, a mix of all sorts of different um, chemicals and components, and it's quite dynamic. Now, John Evelyn's book, Fumifugium, uh, it, it takes in some of these ideas, doesn't it? Because some of it is very visual. Mm. And he addresses his book to uh, King Charles II because he wants something to be done about it. It was one day, as I was walking in Your Majesty's palace at Whitehall, where I have sometimes the honour to refresh myself with the sight of your illustrious presence, which is the joy of your people's heart, that a presumptuous smoke issuing from one or two tunnels near Northumberland House and not far from Scotland Yard did so invade the court that all the rooms, galleries and places about it were filled and infested with it, and that to such a degree as men could hardly discern one another for the cloud. There are some few particular tunnels and issues, belonging only to brewers, dyers, lime burners, salt and soap boilers, and some other private trades, one of whose spiracles alone does manifestly infect the air. Whilst these are belching it forth their sooty jaws, the city of London resembles the face rather of Mount Etna, the court of Vulcan, Stromboli, or the suburbs of hell than an assembly of rational creatures. Mark, this is, this is a very visual way to talk about industrial pollution. I mean, he does use very vivid language, doesn't yeah, absolutely. he? You've got the volcanoes, uh, and it, it has a kind of rather beastly quality, something like a dragon. So this, is, this seems exactly. to be very visible pollution, doesn't it? Absolutely. He's given pollution this almost made it feel alive uh, and therefore more of a threat. In modern times, that element is still required. Um, pollution is not going to be solved uh, by, let's say, a logical argument or a purely economic argument. It has to uh, permeate into the hearts and minds of the general public mm. for them to put pressure on the, shall we say, the powers that be uh, to take action yeah. so that we can uh, reduce the effects of it. What if there appear to be an arsenical vapour, as well as sulphur, breathing sometimes from this intemperate use of sea coal in great cities? That there is what does plainly stupefy is evident to those who fit long by it. Newcastle Coal, as an expert physician, affirms causeth consumptions, physics, and the indisposition of the lungs, not only by the suffocating abundance of smoke, but also by its virulency. For all subterranean fuel hath a kind of virulent or arsenical vapour rising from it, which speedily destroys those who dig it in the mines. Mark Evelyn talks about his expert physician giving views on uh, the impact on human health of particularly burning coal. Um, what, what's the impact on human health of pollutants today? Same or, or different? Well, um, I suppose now we're talking about em maybe trans emissions from transport like nitric oxide, sulfur dioxide, potentially things like volatile organic carbons and things of that nature. They have all sorts of effects, respiratory illnesses, and there's even evidence to suggest that they can have impacts on, on, the, on brain, you know, brain tissue and so on. So they're similar in the sense that they are severe adverse health effects, but the pollutants are different. And so um, how, we, how we measure them, how we vis visualize them um, are different to perhaps then where it was very visible, it was smog, it was thick smoke, yes. and it was clear that you are breathing that in. Whereas now, uh, where a lot of the pollution sources are, let's say from vehicles, the particles are much smaller, essentially uh, invisible to the human eye. 
it's, it's possible to be in a world where you don't necessarily uh, uh, have this sense of urgency because you can't see the effects. But yet we know that pollution kills many, many thousands in the UK every year and millions worldwide. It is this horrid smoke which obscures our churches and makes our palaces look old, which fouls our clothes and corrupts the waters, so as the very rain and refreshing dews which fall in the several seasons precipitate this impure vapour, which, with its black and tenacious quality, spots and contaminates whatever is exposed to it. Now, I like John Evelyn's method of detecting pollution, which is, is kind of, sounds like looking at his white shirt and, and seeing the spots on there. Mm. Now, you have your own detecting system, don't you? Tell us about that. Do you have a portable system like John well, Evelyn's yes. shirt? Well, yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> not quite on the shirt, um, but we, we realised that the then current way how pol air pollution was monitored was very much dependent on large fixed stations that are positioned in specific areas. Ultimately, you know, we are on the move often. And so we developed, we basically uh, took the fixed open path unit and we basically housed it within a box. And initially it was a violin case, uh, if truth be known. So we literally had two people walking with the units down Exhibition Road and all around South Kensington. Uh, and at that time you had people selling newspapers and, and flowers and things on street corners. So we decided to place a unit there um, for about 15-20 minutes just to see you know, what sort of pollution they were being exposed to. Now the average wasn't necessarily a lot higher than elsewhere, however what there were were huge spikes. And those spikes were, were basically um, correlated with the, the changing of the traffic lights. And so it suddenly start, you start to think that a relatively innocent job, like selling newspapers or flowers on the corner, could actually be very dangerous, especially if you're quite vulnerable, because you were being exposed to these spikes time and time again. Not therefore to be forgotten is that which was by many observed, that in the year when Newcastle was besieged and blocked up in our late wars, so as through the great dearth and scarcity of coals, those fumous works, many of them were either left off or spent, but few coals in comparison to what they now use. Divers gardens and orchards planted even in the heart of London were observed to bear such plentiful and infinite quantities of fruits as they never produced the like either before or since. So Mark, we, we, we've, we've spent a little bit of time with John Evelyn. Um, having read Fuma Fugium, what, 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 what impression do you come away with? What, what do you think of Evelyn? This was not uh, John Evelyn's area of expertise per se but he was concerned enough to raise it uh, at the highest level. And sometimes, you know, something like air quality is precisely that type of um, um, topic that, can, that everybody should be concerned about. I like to think of John Evelyn as, a, as an environmental protester, I think. <laughs> I, would, I would say so, yes. I mean, um, he was in a position to influence uh, the powers that be, the decision makers, and he used that position to bring attention to something that didn't just affect him, uh, it affected uh, you know, people much more widely. Uh, and so for that, I think he should be commended. I'm learning a lot of tips here, uh, how, to, um, how to get things done. I think when I get back to Imperial, I'll call one or two of the senior academics, your most sacred, <laughs> <laughs> esteemed, <laughs> your most esteemed, <laughs> sacred scholar.